maximize any disruption. Uh, CMEs and CUs are provided for this event. Um, for today's didactic portion, we're lucky to have Anne-Marie Bott, oncology pharmacist, who will be presenting today on innovative ways to manage nausea. So with that, we'll let Anne-Marie get started. All right, thank you. So this is something that I get to work through each day when I, we practice in the infusion center on ways that we look at handling nausea and really our goal is to prevent nausea from ever occurring. Um, next slide, please. So today, the things that I'd like everyone to take away is to understand what causes nausea and the prevalence, describe the pathways, and then end up talking about the medications that are available as a non-pharmacologic therapy to prevent and treat nausea as well as vomiting. Next slide, please. When we look at the prevalence of nausea in the palliative care program, they have studies have reported that about 36% of patients complain of having nausea when they go to visit a palliative care service on their first visit. We know that towards the end of life, nausea does seem to increase with about 62% of patients reporting nausea, and then by the last week of life, about 71% of patients have nausea. When we look at chemotherapy, it really depends on what medicine we're giving, what causes the amount of nausea. The percentages on this slide represent patients who, without giving any antiemetic, how likely are they to have nausea if we gave them, for instance, cisplatin, which is classified as a highly emetogenetic chemotherapy, versus if we gave someone a monoclonal antibody, such as nivolumab, only less than 10% of patients would have nausea if we gave them nothing to prevent. When we look at, well, what causes nausea, there's this mnemonic out there, which is very appropriate, called VOMIT, and it stands for vestibular, which we think of as motion sickness, obstruction of bowel by constipation, dysmotility of the upper gut, infection or inflammation, such as pneumonia, UTIs, or appendicitis, and then toxins, such as chemotherapy, as well as opioids. People experience nausea can ultimately lead to having issues such as metabolic imbalances, so our electrolytes become imbalanced. We can no longer be able to provide self-care or function. Our nutrition becomes deplete, causing anorexia. We have a decline in our mental status, our ability to be able to have wound assistance, and esophageal tears. When we look at, well, what causes nausea and the severity, we kind of look at five different things. Is it the specific agent? And here I'm thinking more of chemotherapy, the difference between a highly emetogenic versus a minimal risk for emetogenicity. We look at the dose. A lot of times in chemotherapy, it will depend on the dose that we're giving someone, such as a carboplatin dose less than four AUC versus greater than four will change the risk and how much antiemetics need to be prescribed for the patient. Sometimes we can give medications by different routes. The, if someone's getting radiation, how much radiation are they getting, and the site will affect how much nausea the patient could experience, as well as patient variability. Are they male versus female? Are they elderly versus young? Have they history of alcohol abuse? All of those different things will influence the incidence and severity of nausea. As far as the mechanisms, there's four different mechanisms that generally we think about that cause nausea. The chemoreceptor trigger zone, sometimes known as the CTZ, and this is generally caused by drugs. We look at our cerebral cortex, and this a lot of times is caused by anxiety or increase in intracranial pressure. We have our gut, so our GI, when we think of obstruction or inflammation. And then we have vestibular, a lot of times we think of as motion or someone has brain metastasis or opioids can cause vestibular issues. The chemoreceptor trigger zone can be stimulated by these six different things that can then lead to nausea. It can have hypercalcemia, hyponatremia, hepatic failure, renal failure, sepsis, or medications, again, antibiotics, opioids, chemotherapy are generally what we think of for nausea with medicine. When we think of the GI tract, anything that can irritate, obstruct, or slow down the GI tract has a chance of causing nausea and vomiting. And this is a whole list of different things that we know that can cause issues with our GI tract, hence leading to nausea. 
The vestibular tract is stimulated a lot of times um, by motion sickness, a vestibular tumor, or inflammation. So these are generally the three things that we think of that causes vestibular tract issues. As far as our cerebral cortex, we can have anxiety, unpleasant smells, sights, and taste. Our intercranial pressure can be risen. We can have psychiatric disorders as well. So these are a hodgepodge of things that um, can stimulate the cerebral cortex. So we've talked about a lot of things that can stimulate different areas in our brain, but what's causing that is neurotransmitters. And so this slide kind of breaks down which neurotransmitters are linked to these different paths, and then that will help us think about what medications we can use to give to treat. So when we think of our chemoreceptor trigger zone or a GI tract, a lot of times we think of dopamine and serotonin. For a vestibular tract, we think of histamine and acetylcholine. And for a cerebral cortex, we think of GABA and histamine. The main overall neurotransmitters that most of the time we think about are nausea is dopamine and serotonin. So our treatment strategies for treating nausea, first we want to reverse the underlying cause, because if we know what's causing the nausea, hopefully we can relieve that, hence relieving the nausea. The other option is to link the source of the nausea to the neuronal pathway. So do we think it's a dopamine or a serotonin or a GABA receptor that's causing this? And this can kind of help put us in the path for what drug therapy to use. So here's a couple examples to kind of walk us through our thought process. If someone has nausea from a medication, a lot of times we think of our chemoreceptor trigger zone, so we think of dopamine and serotonin. If we think of waves of a patients complaining of abdominal pain or bloating, then we would start thinking about a bowel obstruction or stasis. If we're thinking about a movement-related nausea, then we're thinking about our vestibular dysfunction. So when we go to treat nausea, first it's always important to think of how can we treat it by non-pharmacologic therapies before we begin to think about pharmacologic therapies. So dietary changes. Can we limit the amount of spicy, salty foods? Can, is the person willing to try to have small, frequent meals throughout the day instead of three large meals, more of five to six meals? Environmental, can, are they wearing tight clothing? Can they start wearing loose clothing? Can they rinse their mouth out with water before they go to eat in case they have mucus filled up? Can we eliminate some of strong odors or a particular odor that causes the patient to have nausea? And then complementary therapy, a lot of times we think about acupuncture, Hypnosis and visualization are options for the patient to try. Next, we're going to go into all those different transmitters by looking at what medications block those transmitters from occurring. So the first one we think of is their antidopaminergics. And the most common ones you'll see is prochlorpyrazine, promethazine, haloperidol, and metoclopramide. And the main thing is that when we give these, we need to watch out for QT prolongation and sedation. With permethazine, giving that IV, it's very necrotic to the vein, so it's one of those routes that we try to avoid with that particular medicine. We also want to be cautious with this type of medicine in patients that are at fall risk um, because this will put them at a greater risk for fall. The next drug is our serotonin receptor antagonist. And these are a little bit more expensive on the market, but these are a really effective drug. And there's lots of different drugs in this class on dancetron, genisetron, dilocetron, and velocetron. And a lot of the things about this class that make them unique is we have a lot of different routes to give them based on the drug. So on dancetron can come orally as a solution. It can come as a tablet. It can come as an orally disintegrating tablet. We can give it IV. Genisetron also is available as a patch. Dilocetron, we have to be very cautious with this drug in the chemo setting. It's um, contraindicated to give it an IV, but it is available to give it orally in the chemotherapy setting. And then Velocitron is a long-acting 5-HT3 that really binds strongly to the 5-HT3 receptor and lasts for several days. It's, um, we give this drug most of the time IV. It is available in combination with other medicines. The main side effects that we counsel patients on with the 5-HT3s is it does cause constipation as well as a headache. The next drug we look at is antihistamine, and these are diphenhydramine, hydroxazine, and meclizine. And a lot of times we use this for that 
unknown um, action in the vomiting center, whether it's an inner ear pathology or if we're trying to use it as an adjuvant to other antiemetics. And the main side effects we think of with antihistamines, of course, is sedation, constipation, and dry mouth. For the benzodiazepines, we generally think of lorazepam and diazepam. These are really helpful if a patient has nausea, so anticipatory nausea before they come to receive chemotherapy. Lorazepam is a good option. It will cause sedation as well as confusion, so those are things to counsel the patient about as well. As far as the cannabinoids, we, um, in the pharmacology world, we have dronabinol, and this is an oral medication that patients use a lot of times for appetite stimulation as well as for nausea. The side effects a lot of times we have to watch out for is tachycardia, but low blood pressure as well as hallucinations and slow digestion. The next drug that a lot of times we use is corticosteroids. Here a lot of times we think about dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, and prednisone. We do use this a lot in the oncology world for bone pain as well as appetite stimulation and to help prevent nausea. It's a very good acute and delayed medication for nausea in the chemotherapy setting. We do have to watch out because it is a steroid, so thinning of the bones as well as increased blood pressure, and patients can talk about staying awake at night, so a lot of times we recommend to take it in the morning um, versus taking it before they go to bed. Scopolamine is another option. It's an anticholinergic and it's prescribed in patch form. Uh, the patient can place this and wear this every 72 hours. The things to watch out for with this medication is it can cause confusion as well as dizziness. A newer agents on the market are what we call our neurokinin-1 antagonist. And a lot of drugs have recently come out on the market. Uh, Fosaprepotent, naprepotent, fosaprepotent is the IV formulation, naprepotent is the oral. We have rolapotent and dupotent, and these are other options that are given to patients to prevent chemotherapy-induced nausea. These can be oral or IV, depending on the drug, and they do help in both the acute and delayed setting of nausea. And the main side effects people will experience are more of diarrhea and fatigue. The next slide is just a quick overview. It's something to realize that this can be used as a reference by the Center of Advanced Palliative Care that talks about the different classes of medications that are available for nausea, how they work, what they're used for, and then side effects to consider. So if you're just trying to get a quick overview, this is a good reference to know is available. Now we're going to focus on chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. So the next couple of slides are going to focus on the NCCN guidelines, and this is more of just to show you that this is a great resource when you're looking at someone that's going to be receiving chemotherapy to realize based on the metagenetic risk the chemotherapy has been assigned, it gives you options of what to give based on the imaginicity. So this is always seems to be updating, especially how much steroids we end up giving, but the latest guidelines are shown here. And the top shows that this is for highly imaginative chemotherapy, so a lot of times we think of cisplatin or for breast cancer, doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide combination. And so the options are showing you to give a neurokinin-1 plus a 5-HT3 plus dexamethasone. So that's one option. Another option is to give a lanzapine, colocitron, and dexamethasone. And then the third option that they have now is to give a lanzapine and neurokinin-1, a 5-HT3, and dexamethasone. So this is just to show you you have different pockets and why someone would be on different regimens. This is just to give you a reference for why and what the guidelines tell us today. Next slide. So in the moderate emetic risk, they have three different options as well. Without giving a mint, you could just give a 5-HT3 receptor and dexamethasone. 
You could give the same regimen that they recommended in highly imaginetic with the olanzapine, palocitron, and dexamethasone. Or you have the option of giving the 5-HT with dexamethasone but adding on that norokinin 1 inhibitor if you feel that they are at risk, higher risk for nausea. They're showing that that is an option in the moderate setting. Next slide. When we look at lower minimal risk, minimal risk, you don't need to give anything as a prevention. For low, you just give one drug. And the drug classes they recommend or the steroids, the dexamethasone, metoclopramide, prochlorpyrazine, or a 5-HT3. So you have options based on the patient. Um, one of these four drug classes would be appropriate to give the patient as a prevention. We also have guidelines for not only IV chemotherapy but also for oral chemotherapy and here they're pretty clear they just divided it into either a low minimal risk or someone that has a moderate high risk. And so if they have a moderate or high risk you're going to go ahead and just give them one drug which they recommend is a 5-HT3 or serotonin inhibitors. If they have low or moderate it's more of on an as needed basis. And they give you three options of metoclopramide, prochlorpyrazine, or a 5-HT3 antagonist. This is a really good slide to think about for breakthrough nausea because it kind of goes over all the different medicines that we have available for nausea for the most part. So you could give olanzapine, you could give lorazepam, you could give dronabinol, haloperidol, metoclopramide, scopolamine, prochlorpyrazine or promethazine, or a 5-HT3, or dexamethasone. So essentially, if you haven't tried it in the past, and they're still having nausea, you could consider one of these options to add on to what they're currently receiving. They also give information regarding radiation therapy. So really, it shows here that it depends on the location and the type of radiation the patient is receiving, which will dictate which pre-medication they should get if they need an NA at all. And here they're showing to give a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist or, and or a steroid. And the last thing that Nancy Scan Guidelines focuses on is anticipatory nausea. And I think the thing that's really awesome here is that they are only showing drug therapy, but they're also showing behavioral therapy such as hypnosis, relaxation exercises, yoga, cognitive distraction, acupuncture, in addition to the need if you needed a lorazepam before. So there is several options here, not just drug therapy for anticipatory nausea that they do recommend. So kind of summarizing our clinical pearls to take away when we go to treat nausea and vomiting. The most common pathway is through the GI and the chemoreceptor trigger zone. So the neurotransmitters we think about are dopamine and serotonin. And these are the most effective ways to treat nausea if you're not sure to try either an antidopaminergic or a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist. So when we think about opioid-induced nausea, we generally think of our antidopaminergics such as prochlorpyrazine. When we think of chemotherapy and radiation therapy caused nausea, we think of our serotonin receptor antagonist. And anticipatory nausea, we think of our benzodiazepine. And NCCN guidelines talks about lorazepam. As far as delayed gastric dampening, we think of antidopaminergics. Brain metastasis, we think of dexamethasone. And then vestibular causes, we think of scopolamine. So it's important to titrate the antiemetic up to the full dose before you go and add another antiemetic. If it's still uncontrolled, then you want to add on an antiemetic from a different class. So if you try the antidopaminergic, then you can try to add on a serotonin receptor inhibitor. If it's chemotherapy-induced, it's really important that we prophylactically prevent nausea, and we do this based on what the risk is of that chemotherapy regimen that we're giving the patient using the guidelines. And then lastly, just a quick summary from the CAP guidelines, kind of putting it all together. When we assess the patient, if the cause is unknown, then generally you think of our first-line agents as our antidopaminergic and our 5-HT3 receptor antagonists. If we do know the cause and it's irreversible, then we should try to match the neurotransmitter with what we think is causing it to know our drug therapy option. If it's reversible, then we, of course, try to assess the reversible causes to prevent the nausea from occurring in the first place. Any questions or anything from the audience? Well, thank you for presenting. I know I have questions. Are there questions out there? All right. I'll ask 
my first question. Um, in your experience in working with patients getting chemotherapy, we talk about the anticipatory nausea. I saw in the NCC guidelines there was a suggestion of pre-treating the night before and setting up um, just like minimizing that anxiety, not just right before, but even the night before, kind of that buildup that might occur. And, you know, there's some thought now in pain literature that our nervous system can kind of uh, ramp up over time. And in the same way, you could imagine the anxiety ramping up over time. So I wonder if how important you think it is to identify this type of nausea, treat it early in the course of chemotherapy in order to help it, maybe help prevent it from getting worse. If you think that's a, a thing or or not, because... Yes, so it is definitely something we consider and the oncologists definitely talk um, to the patient before they ever go and receive chemotherapy. One of the things that we standardly have on our orders for chemotherapy is the order for PRN nausea with using lorazepam. Mm -hmm. So we always have that standard so it's available for the nurses. And then if we realize that they're becoming having that anticipatory nausea, then it is prescribed to give to them before they even come into the facility. Yeah, Chrissy. Um, I don't think this was one of your first line agents, but one of the medicines that you uh, mentioned was Reglan or Metoclopramide. Yeah, and I know with that one, it always raises a red flag with me to make sure we've checked the QTC. Are there any of the other nausea medicines that that should be on the radar for? Um, about every nausea medicine okay. seems to cause QTC prolongation. Um, the 5-HT3 receptor antagonists are really known to do that. But they have shown that the philocitron has less risk for QT prolongation than some of the others. So the class in general causes it, but not every drug within that class is as offensive. We also know that antidopaminergics, such as prochlorpyrazine and promethazine, are very common offenders as well. And if you look at the guidelines, you're kind of combining them all. So you really look at the assessment of the patient and what their other past medical history is to try to help decide, is it too much or do you need to further monitor that or not? And that was going to be my question. Looking at those guidelines, most of them combine two agents that would prolong QTC. A lot, a lot of them you know, have palinocitron too, which you said is a little bit lower risk. But let's say someone does have a history of a slightly prolonged QTC or they're on a drug like methadone or something that also prolongs the QTC. What, how might you consider altering their regimen? Or if they had breakthrough, what would you consider in lieu of our typical breakthrough? So some of the things we do, if we're really worried about it, we start off with more of one agent instead of adding on. And a lot of times these patients aren't on these medicines chronically. Mm -hmm. They're more of like one or two doses. So that also changes, I think, the risk of how long are you going to have that QT prolongation. I have a question too. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's the PRN versus scheduling and being proactive before you get into cyclic vomiting. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you had recommendations just about how do you counsel patients as far as whether they should be around the clock scheduling it or mm -hmm. versus just wait till you get the nausea and the vomiting and then start taking it. Yes, yeah, so one of the things we always counsel patients on in the infusion center because we do dispense a lot of as needed medicines, especially on Dancitron and Prochlorpyrazine, is we talk to them about trying one agent first versus the other and then if they have severe nausea or vomiting, they can put them together because they're working in different ways. But as far as trying to prevent it, you're always better to prevent it. And I think that's one of the nice things we do by following the NCC and guidelines is we're preventing the nausea, hopefully, before it ever happens by giving them the tools in the beginning. And then we always tell them at the first sign of nausea to go ahead and start those as-needed medicines. Also, as patients start to receive chemotherapy, they kind of get a sense or someone chronically has nausea at a certain time of day or whatever, they can kind of analyze and know when they should start to take their medicine. Great. Then uh, another question too was in regards to alternative routes, like I know you mentioned, um, you know, for example, on Dancetron has dissolvable um, for formulations, but, uh, but also rectally too, like just maybe talking about that and, and just uh, the expenses of those and, you know, mm -hmm. like when do you ever go that route versus 
using it dissolvable, which can be really expensive. Right, right. So I think it really depends on the patient and what their preference is. Um, we don't, I haven't seen us use rectal route very often at all. Um, the nice thing about the orally dissolvable is it's such a small amount and it's pretty fast. As soon as it puts on their tongue, they start dissolving it. We also have the option for a lot of these medicines, we can crush them. Um, and take them that way as well. I had a more general question about this: the love affair with Zofran across <laughs> medical specialties. <laughs> I think there's this perception that it's a fairly benign drug that might help, but there's not a lot of necessarily mechanistic thought as to what's causing the nausea and what might be the best med. And particularly with GI causes, you saw that the, your recommendation, and certainly there might be some effect from a serotonin um, or anti-serotonin drug, but um, was the anti-dopamine drugs. Um, and I wonder why there's this love for Zofran more than, say, prochlorperazine or some of its relatives. Uh, so my thoughts probably are one um, prescribing preference, but also if you look at the side effects, um, for on Dancitron, it's constipation and headache, whereas um, prochlorperazine is more sedation and dizziness. So if you're worried about risk for falls or any of those type of things that the patient wants to try to stay awake during the day, for chlorpyrazine, it's probably not going to be as easy um, to, for the patient with this versus um, a 5-HT3. And finally, I'm sorry, we have so many it's questions. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, in palliative care, we, always, we are often thinking about the difficult cases of nausea, the breakthrough cases where they've had this excellent pretreatment around chemotherapy, but they still have ongoing nausea. And so we're desperate for other agents. And I wonder if there's any thought that there'd be any role in the future. I know the research is in chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting, but in NK1 receptor use as a breakthrough or for a different indication for nausea. Do you think mechanistically that could come into play as a, a tool for us in the future? Um, potentially. Uh, you know, it's a neurokine and one receptor antagonist and um, what I know in the literature is that really it's been studied in the chemotherapy setting, um, and I haven't um, seen the literature for other resources as well. Yeah. And all the approved FDA indications for all these seem to so far just be in the chemotherapy setting. So. Trisha. Uh, I just wanted to go back to the QTC issue a little bit. Um, I think what I heard you saying, Anne Marie, is that. You know, and often when I've come and consulted with you, it's the number of drugs that potentially prolong it and then also how frequently someone is taking those drugs. If it's, you know, just as needed, you know, a couple times a month, we worry less than if somebody's doing methadone and, you know, 24 milligrams of Zofran a day plus like an SSRI or something. Um, but I guess my question is, let's say we do have somebody who is kind of regularly taking maybe three or more, you know, QTC prolonging agents. What is the monitoring for that? How frequently do we do EKGs or we suggest EKGs? And then what is the, I'm also curious on, you know, how often do these, we're worried about a fatal arrhythmia, right? With this is that bottom line, what we're worried about. So then how often does that actually happen and which might guide our, you know, actions in, in that case? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, my thoughts is I would refer them to a cardiologist um, to have their look at their risk and kind of get a baseline before you and see where they are, maybe a baseline with them being on all these drugs, or maybe it's a baseline before you go and add on scheduled, more scheduled uh, medications for the nausea. But I'll open the field in case anyone else has any thoughts on that from experience. I think that we, we usually check baseline, at least on an inpatient, we'll check a baseline at QTC. But also something to think about that maybe gets pushed away, like we think straight QTC, but Electrolyte abnormalities can lead to that QTC prolongation, which can add up. So if you have somebody, especially it's really tricky in this instance, where if you have somebody that is having nausea vomiting, you may have more electrolyte imbalances, which may put them at even more risk of a QTC prolongation. So I think it's probably there isn't anything standard, Tricia, on how often to check it, but definitely getting a baseline. And then, um, you know, if they're using those PRNs a lot, maybe start checking them once a month or depending on you know, how often they're in. On inpatient, sometimes we do it a lot more regularly just because we have it available to us. And Tricia, I, I found something just on methadone alone, looking at risk stratification of different um, degrees of prolongation to try and get a sense of 
a more qualitative sense of mild, moderate, severe, um, and how to think about that with some suggestions as to how frequently to monitor them. But like what Amy said, it's focusing on the other risk factors in addition to it. Do they have structural heart disease? Are they older? Do they have electrolyte abnormalities? Things like that. And so there's not, there's not like really evidence-based recommendations, but there's at least some consensus based on things that we know do prolong the QTC and put people at risk. But there's no single study showing that I found just how at risk you are of, of dying from sudden death from an arrhythmia. But it's certainly scary, and a lot of our patients need to be on lots of these medications, you know, from a palliative standpoint or even just from tolerating just their treatment that they need for, for, for to cure their cancer, so. And then the, the other thing I was just going to add, too, is just thinking about the goals of care overall, like prognostication is so important because, again, what's your threshold of getting them to a cardiologist or, or doing EKGs when maybe mm -hmm. someone's out in a village and it's a matter of days or weeks and really your focus is on comfort and, um, and so in quality of life rather than necessarily length of life. So you got to balance that. The other thing I was just going to bring up, too, that I was thinking about is Parkinsonism and just being really careful about the types of anti-emetics you use in, those, in that patient population because of the extra pyramidal side effects that these uh, different medications have. Um, so also keeping that in mind as well when you're trying to think of what meds to use. So. Yeah, I agree with you, Chris. And what was nice about this one guideline I saw is it did recommend as you get into like the moderate or severe, you start the process of shared decision making. So you share that we're incurring a small, but not, you know, not quite measurable risk here that puts you at risk of having an arrhythmia. But your nausea is really debilitating for you. Well, how do you feel about that? Like how serious is this symptom? Would you be willing to take this risk? And that's something you would do with methadone as well. Like we think this medication could be really helpful for you. We'd like to continue to increase it. And you share that risk with the family and patient so they don't find out later that you knew about this risk and were worried about it, but they didn't know about it and then something bad happened. So it is that sort of goal, goal concordant symptom management. Any last questions? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So it's Nancy. I'm over in uh, SCF. Um, hey. Old nurse. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. There are a lot of young people out there. And I don't. I can't imagine. I would love to see hands up as to who has had to deal with nausea for weeks and see how debilitating and spiral and anxiety provoking that really is. Has anyone had to deal with that? No. I didn't think so. The fact is, is, do you have in your oncology or in your clinic, do you have any people who come in? And they either study meditation, they get to the point where they're doing some happening, or they're doing both, or fasting to try to get over this nausea, trying to treat the, you know, the nausea rather than all on the drugs. So there, so there are two parts. I think one, one part of what you said is just pointing out how truly life-altering this symptom can be. Um, nausea can be extreme it can make you not want to socialize similar to severe pain which we spend a lot of time focusing and thinking about nausea itself can be something that's anxiety provoking prevents you from sleeping interacting you're not participating in the social aspects of eating there's so many ways in which it can limit your life um, and so patients may choose to take more extreme measures so that was i think the second part of what you said is have we seen people alter their lifestyle or avoid nutrition because they just can't handle knowing they're going to throw up again. Um, I've definitely seen patients avoid, avoid meals, um, just feel like I'd rather sit here and fast and, and feel better than, um, than to eat. And I'll, I'll open that up briefly to the group before we get to our case presentation. But I would uh, like to book in here briefly. We had some disruption on that last question there. Um, if anyone has trouble hearing someone, please speak up and let us know. And please be aware that you can always put a question into the group chat, and I will draw our presenters' attention to it so that they can read it out for you.
Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, thank you for calling attention to that. Yeah, chat box is open for anybody that um, has difficulty sending the questions. Rana. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. So in addition to what you're saying, um, they won't eat or else they'll choose their meals depending on what they want to taste when it comes back up, which isn't necessarily yep. the healthiest option. Yeah. <laughs> or they'll avoid their favorite foods because they don't want to start associating that with throwing up. So. One, one thing I have found that was helpful when I was working in infusion was, especially with the platinums, a lot of times the oxaloplatin and the cisplatin has that metallic taste that can be really, really off-putting. Um, I always tell people not to taste their favorite foods because their brain knows what those foods are supposed to be tasting like, and a lot of times that leads to more nausea. Um, and so trying something different, it often can um, make them tolerate something a little bit differently because your brain doesn't know how that's supposed to taste. It works in a few cases. Well, I've definitely heard patients mention that to me after the fact. Oh, since starting treatment, I'm eating foods I haven't eaten since I was a kid, and I'm not wanting my, my foods from before that were my favorite. So it's, it's interesting. People kind of naturally adapt to experiment a little bit. Well, I want to make sure we have enough time for the case presentation. Thank you for the for the lecture. Um, so, Chris, I'll let you do some introductions. Great. We're going to go ahead and uh, do introductions with all the groups. Um, 